Welcome to Town Talk, the official podcast of Somerville, South Carolina, where we bring you the latest news and special guests here in the town of Somerville. And today, I'm super excited to meet with Superintendent Dr. Shane Robbins uh, with DD2. How are you doing today? Awesome. It, uh, it's Thursday. It's a little rainy, but we're yes. on spring break uh, here in DD2, so it's a little quiet around the office. Yeah, I noticed that the traffic has been a little easier getting around. I'm, it's been nice, but I don't think it's going to last too long. Uh, no, just a few more days. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I appreciate you taking the time to come on the podcast. Uh, you were, you guys reached out to me. You were on my, I was talking to you before we started recording. You were on my list when I first started this project a year ago that to come on and you definitely have been requested and I'm I think the community is really going to enjoy this episode so let's dig in absolutely um to start I I think for myself and the community could you just share a little bit more about you and what brought you to your current role as a superintendent sure and you know I always like to start um when I speak about that is talk about my family I love um, that. Because I'm very, you know, I believe in three, you know, uh, principles, and that's faith, family, and job, um, and in that specific order. But I'm married; been married for over 25 years. Congratulations! Thank you. Um, I'm here because of her, because my wife has been incredibly supportive of my uh, career journey. So I, I'm very blessed to be married to Heather. Uh, we have two boys. We have a son who graduated from Coastal Carolina University and actually works here in the low country as a surveyor. Oh, uh, nice. So yeah, very nice to have him nearby. And then our youngest son is a senior accounting major at the College of Charleston. Wow. So my family is, you know, rooted here in the low country. And then I have an added benefit of my parents living here as well. Wow. So the whole when, family, the whole family. So when we moved to Somerville, my parents moved here with us. And, um, and actually, when we moved to South Carolina, they moved here with us as well. So my family is here and that gives, you know, I mean, they are the most important thing to me. And um, again, I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for them. Yeah, no. And so how long have you lived in, in the Somerville area? So I am in year two. We moved here in June of 2022 when I accepted the job. Uh, we actually moved down from Kershaw County, Okay. Okay. Uh, which is where I was a superintendent for four years prior to this position. Oh, wow. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about your career and sure. where, what led you to this point. Right. So where did your career start and then how did it progress over the years? You, you know, um, I, and I always, when I talk to young people, you know, about their careers, I always say, don't think your career is going to be a straight line. Um, it does take some, you know, lefts and right turns. Absolutely. And my, mine obviously has done that. Uh, I didn't start out in the field of education. I have a degree in allied health and athletic training, and I worked in healthcare. I was an industrial athletic trainer, so oh, wow. I worked in the okay. field of occupational health. And lo and behold, I, I like to share this story because to me, uh, you know, I talk about God moments and where things just kind of present themselves. But I went back to graduate school and I had a choice to um, either major in clinical or sport biomechanics or kinesiology um, based on the graduate assistantship I had received. And so when I went in to meet with my um, with my counselor, I asked her, you know, what her thoughts were and what I what you know what direction would you push me and she said well you can major in whatever you want to it's your it's your scholarship well at the time i was working in a clinic yeah and i was covering high schools in the evening um as an athletic trainer and so i said so are you telling me that i could major in secondary education she said if that's what you want and i always had this feeling that i wanted to teach and i wanted to be on site as an athletic trainer and a coach and so I went to graduate school and I got my degree in secondary education wow. and I transitioned from healthcare into education. I taught science, health and health career courses and I was a head athletic trainer for a high school. Okay. And that got me, you know, my start in education. Still had no desire for necessarily leadership, yeah. Um, but as I continued my education, um, I, I naturally just started to ascend um, because my goal has been real simple, and that is I I don't like the title. Um, you know, it just comes with the job. What I like is the opportunity to hopefully make a difference for people. That's amazing. And um, so I, I'm a big believer in selfless service. And so yeah, that's kind of what got me, you know, started in the career field in general. Okay, so that's, that's so unique how, how it yeah. starts, yeah. and uh, a lot of stories are like that, right? Yeah. You don't, yeah. where everyone kind of ends up in their career, most of the time it's not where it starts, and so it's cool that you have always had 
that that mindset but would you agree that is most of it's kind of like a service like the ser- internal you want to give service mm-hmm. back to the community type of feel that you had a- absolutely and you know the one thing i didn't share is i've been in the military for 34 years thank you for your service thank you um and it's been definitely a blessing and it's taught me a lot about leadership and you know we have an acronym that we use in the army for leadership it's loyalty duty respect selfless service honor integrity and personal courage and that whole selfless service piece i just feel like you know that's been my calling is to try to serve Serve, you know, at whatever capacity and skills that I have uh, in a community. And so the same holds true. You know, it's just that my sphere of influence is honestly, you know, increased where it was a, a classroom of students um, to a building of staff and students to, um, you know, a small school district to now, you know, what I consider to be, um, you know, the awesome opportunity to be the superintendent in a large school district in a growing um, community like Dorchester County. Absolutely. And you, so you were in the military for many years and you also had a, a very unique career. How did all of those experiences lead you to be able to effectively lead DD2? Well, you know, I think with any leadership role um, and just in life in general is you have to experience failure. And um, I still experience that sometimes daily, sometimes weekly. But I think what I learned from it is, you know, those failures are not necessarily they aren't critical um, if the intent is the right way and if you learn from them. So I, I remember one time I went into a classroom my first year as a building principal and uh, with a science background, I went yeah. into a chemistry class and they were uh, in the middle of a lab. And afterwards, you could tell it was a little, you know, disoriented, um, maybe not the best lab. And the teacher came up to me and apologized. She said, it's the first time that I ever tried the lab that way. I know it didn't work out the best. And I said, stop, stop, stop. I said, I didn't come in to see perfection. I said, I'm happy to hear you were trying to do something different and you're going to learn and make corrections and and make it different. I said, that's the only way we grow. And so I, I hopefully that's the way, you know, I impress upon people when I'm around them and the way I lead is you're, you're not going to be perfect, um, but grow from where you see things didn't work out necessarily the way you wanted them to. I love that. And that's such a, that's such a good message because not, no one is perfect. Right. And you know, when they're, I mean, I can only speak for myself in these situations, but when I am, when a leader is watching me do my role, right. There is that, that internal, Part of me is like, oh, I gotta do my best. I yeah. gotta be for everyone's yeah. like that, right? Yeah. When they when they're watching, right? And you know, your approach to leadership is unique in the sense that, listen, I don't want you to try to be perfect. I want you to be yourself, and I want you to really think outside the box and what you're trying to do, right? Because I, in my opinion, that type of leadership will push out better results, right? Um, and really make bigger impacts you know as well you know some idea that a let's just say a teacher may have for a a a classroom and for a certain subject might be something that those students remember for the rest of their lives right and so that that I, i really applaud you for for that type of leadership um you know switching gears a little bit we so as a superintendent you came you came in this role two years ago correct correct okay so you now you got your feet you know you're you're in you're you're getting used to everything um so when you came in and to now what is kind of your overall vision and some of your goals as the superintendent of dd2 well i will say my vision and my goals as an educator um they evolve you know i'm in my 16th year as a superintendent and so if i were to say i'm my vision and my goals are the same today as they were 16 years ago i would not be honest um, because the world has changed and so my goals um, evolve and adapt with the with the world that we live in and so my big belief is is the way we ensure students are achieving is to try to make sure that we are engaging students and the way we engage students isn't necessarily from the content we're delivering, but it's the manner in which we're delivering it. And so um, 
ensuring they have a 21st century learning environment experience. So I use um, with staffs occasionally a picture of a classroom from the 40s, 50s, and 60s where you see this industrial model, straight yep. lines, you know, you might even sit in a classroom like that. And then I show the 21st century model where it's not straight lines and it's small groups and it's, you know, different seating environments that we wouldn't think of a classroom if you're an older generation. Generation. But we were preparing people to go into the manufacturing industry, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. And today it's not. Technology has changed the way we work. You know, you've got remote workers, you've got small groups. You don't see the cubicles and the straight lines anymore. And so my vision is to make sure we're continuing to adapt mm. to the environment that we're sending our students into. Uh, and that's what I've tried to bring um, to Dorchester School District, too. I think, um, and I hate saying this too much because I want us to forget about it, but I think the pandemic taught some school districts that you needed to adapt when we went into a virtual environment and they weren't prepared to how to most effectively integrate technology into their classrooms. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, you know, my big focus um, from an academic standpoint is how can we do that to improve outcomes with our students and prepare them for the next step in life, whether that's the military, that's higher education or a career in the community. Wow. That's that, I love to hear that. Cause you, so you have that innovative mindset thinking, okay, here's how we need to prepare you know, for the future and for where technology and where the world is today mm -hmm. and not be behind, but rather be ahead. Correct. Um, and cause I mean, and it'll, it'll help prepare, you know, our, the, the, our children for their future, which right. is, you know, when they get out in the real world, their, the technology where it's at today is going to hit them mm -hmm. right where they're at. Mm -hmm. And so they don't want, they don't want to start behind. Rather you guys are focused on having them start ahead. Right. I, I love that. So when it comes to like the technology and that those type of innovative approaches, what are some of the strategies that you guys are implementing to, to stay ahead? Well, you know, I think uh, first and foremost, we're, we're working, we've worked real hard in my two years here with our technology integration um, specialist on helping prepare teachers on how to use the technology in the classroom. Because a lot of times you'll hear um, parents or people from afar who don't understand that they think their, their kids are simply sitting behind a, a a keyboard and a screen and that's not what we want whatsoever that's just a small uh, fraction of it so we have a um a rating system that is specifically for our digital learning environment our dle when we go into classrooms observe to see where some of our gaps and weaknesses are yeah uh, we actually have really put some money into that department so we have a, a department now called educational technology services oh, wow. okay. that co-integrates with our academic team so they do most of the technology integration but they also have technology integration specialists that work with our academic team for the training uh, that we may need. I'll, I'll be honest, and I'm going to be um, very biased on this, but what I would say is I feel like in public ed, in a lot of locations, we do a better job preparing teachers for that environment than higher ed does as they send them to our public schools. So uh, I'm very proud of you know the emphasis and effort we put into that. That's amazing. I, I remember when I... Uh, I'm I'm 26. Or I'm about to be 26 in in a, a couple of days, but I'm one of the youngest at yep. Town Hall. Let's yeah, just put yeah. it that way. Um, but so I'm when I was in high school, I think it was like my senior year is when my high school first implemented iPads for mm -hmm. us. And I remember all of us were super excited about oh we're gonna be able to play games and <laughs> <laughs> all that fun stuff. But so when. The, the reason I bring that up is there is challenges mm -hmm. that that come with implementing technology. Absolutely. How do you approach those type of challenges? For example, me being excited to play some games on my iPad my senior year of high school. Right. So, you know, there is a federal law. It's called the SEPA law, the Child Internet Protection Act, that requires you to have certain provisions in place to try to safeguard your students. But we, our department, and, and listen, you're 26, so you know. You know how 
how to use a proxy server. You know how to get around <laughs> some of our blocks that we have. Um, but we have people that are dedicated to screening that every day oh, um, to wow, make sure good. that we're yeah. screening the best we can. Um, some of the things that may intrude into a classroom that aren't supposed to be there. Uh, we, we do have really good software that helps us with that. It's not, it's not foolproof, obviously. And so we have that human element that um, is in existence to help assist us with that in terms of our systems engineers and stuff like that. But the other thing too is the use of technology is such a broad word. And so we are really trying to make sure we have a unified vision for our approach and our use of it. Because if you don't, it's very difficult to measure the outcomes. And mm, so having yeah. a unified vision with the type of software we're using, how we're using it and implementing it will help us, you know, generate data that says it's effective or it's not effective. And so we honestly have spent, you know, the you know, first part of my two year tenure here, I'm trying to look at making sure that vision was in place with our digital ecosystem and how we have our systems and our processes in place. That's amazing. So it, the fact that you guys are are forward thinking on the the, the safety and the systems and processes in place with the, your with technology is, is awesome to hear. And then also knowing that you implemented and have a team of professionals here that oversee the safety of our children as well from a technology standpoint uh, is, is awesome. So I applaud you guys for being ahead because I know my school, I'm from Pennsylvania, so that, you know, that school district's in Pennsylvania, but they just gave us iPads, you know, yeah, yeah. there was, there was nothing. And I know there's still probably schools out there that do that, that same thing. Right. And so the fact that you guys are ahead and thinking for, forward thinking on that is very encouraging, very, very encouraging. Um, now one thing in our latest episode, uh, we interviewed, uh, our SRO, uh, Montez Aiken. Mm -hmm. Um, and he, he talked about some of the challenges and one of them being social media. Mm -hmm. um, we spent, uh, it was a great conversation him and I had, um, just the challenges that we see with social media, especially in our children. Um, and I mean, just in, in, in everyone and adults, right. I mean, social media is a, is a, a positive and a negative in our society when it comes to social media and that, uh, aspect, how do you guys tackle that? As a, as a school district. You know, um, I'm going to use the metaphor of um, that was once shared with me, and it's like eating an elephant. You know, <laughs> so when you ask how we're attacking it, it's one bite at a time. You know, there is no silver bullet, you know, honestly, to, to fix this. But our PIO department, um, as well as our building level administrators and our tech department, they're constantly looking through social media posts. You know, we really rely on, you know, anonymous reporting if yeah. there's anything that we should be concerned about. Absolutely. But, but, you know, part of the SEPA law and part of on your um, school district assigned devices, you can't access social media on our servers. So they're blocked okay. um, on our servers. But you do have, you know, personal cell phones cell and phones stuff, different, and, yeah. you know, that is the workaround for, for some students. And we're, we're working on what's a solution for that. Um, but I'll go back to even more than social media and just safety in general. The thing that I impress upon people to remember is as we increase our safety protocols, it does come with a level of inconvenience. I've used that saying for um, several years and that level of inconvenience, the level of convenience has been provided by the technology. The level of inconvenience is making sure we're safeguarding kids while they're on our campuses. And again, I'll be the first to say we do not have it perfect. Um, and it's something that we're trying to look at every single day, every single week. Um, we actually have just put together a safety task force. We have a safety committee that meets, but this safety task force is going to look at internal operations on what we can do better to, to safeguard our students and, and cell phones and um, social media are on that agenda to talk about. Oh, that, that, that's, that's great. And I think um, you bring up a really good point uh, that it is, it is a challenge, and especially with cell phones, because 
you know, especially in in the high school ages, you know, most of them probably have cell phones at that point. Oh, yeah. um, they're out and about, they're driving. So as a parent, I know when my daughter gets that age, I'll definitely want her to have a cell phone so she can, she can keep in touch and tell me, you know, where she's at and all right. that fun stuff. But you know, I know not probably not many students are going to be listening to the podcast. Maybe they will. I, I encourage them to. Um, but the one thing I saw that really piqued my interest is I don't know where I saw it, um, but there's some schools that are implementing this. Uh, I don't know how to explain it, but it's on every student's desk. And it's this pouch of some sort. And Yonder pouch. So you know, you've seen it. Yes. It, 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 uh, what, what is that about? So um, the yonder pouch, now remember I told you I'm in the military. So whenever I go into briefings, my cell phone goes in a pouch. But that pouch and my, my smartwatch and that pouch blocks all the signals. The yonder oh, wow. pouch does not do that, but the yonder pouch is a pouch that your cell phone goes in, it's magnetized, uh, almost like a security um, tag that you'll see in a department store. And so the administrator, the teacher, whoever has the key that can unlock the pouch. But when students, there's a couple different protocols that districts use. When students come in the building, it goes in the pouch. So there's no cell phone usage once you're in the building. Or when you come in the classroom, it goes in the pouch and it stays within the student's um, person. Uh, and the teacher is the only one that has the ability to unlock it. And so a lot of times they'll put a, a magnet on the wall and as a student leaves, they hit it and it unlocks the pouch and they get access so super to it. Easy, yeah. Right. And so that, that is something that this task force is considering and we're looking at um that goes back to the level of inconvenience yeah and you know i'm gonna sidebar here a little bit i'll just share a personal story so you know i shared that i have two kids and you know i'm a, i've been a superintendent uh, for 16 years and i remember one specific year my wife had sent my son a text message and he was in school and i don't know if she and i were at lunch together or how i knew it but i just remember saying why did you do that she said, well, you know, so he'll see it after school. I'm like, what kid has a cell phone that gets a text message that's not going to look at it right there on the spot? I said, come on, you know, he's the superintendent's kid. And you're, she's like, well, I just, you know, so if, if the superintendent's wife is thinking that way, you know, and we have 27,000 students, it's a natural inclination for a parent to want to communicate with Absolutely. their child. So what that pouch does is if they come in the classroom and use it just in the classroom, then they're not going to be apt to want to look at their cell phone and see a text message that popped through, whether it's from a friend or a parent, and then they can access it when class is out. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is it's in the pouch all day long. But again, we, we haven't rested on whether we're even going to go down the pouch route, yeah. but we are looking at it. So, all right, that, that's cool yeah. because I, I don't know where I saw it. I'm trying yeah. to remember where I saw it, but it was, it was a cool little innovation that I think actually could be a good alternative to mm -hmm. that approach. Now, my catch-22 or devil's advo advocate to this is what processes are in place so if a parent you know i guess it goes back to the old-fashioned ways right so if a parent does need to get a hold of their of their child right it, they go through the the old-fashioned protocols right that you know right. they can call and you know they'll reach yeah. the teacher and yeah so you call the front office yeah and every single classroom has a phone yeah. and you know um, the front office will call uh, the classroom you, you know you really unless even if it's an emergency we can get to them immediately yeah um, but if they're calling or texting in the middle of class think of the disruption that creates within the classroom when a teacher is trying to manage a class and teach mm -hmm. we can get to them really quickly you know all of our administrators have walkie talkies like i said the front office has a phone we have a computer we can pull them up in power school we can determine what classroom they're in and every we've gone through this year part of our safety audit was to upgrade um, from analog to digital phones in all of our classrooms so that we have that immediate connection oh, that's so nice. that's really awesome um, you know we can get to we can get to your child really quickly without you texting or calling them i think a lot of our community especially the parents are going to love to hear that knowing that it's all it's just as immediate probably as a text i mean there maybe is an extra step instead of sending right. a text you're gonna to have to call right. but it's still one step right one the step. text is yep. the same step as a call right. 
Um, so I, I'm excited to see uh, what you guys uh, decide to do down that route. And I think it's a challenge that not just y'all are facing, but the country and the yeah, world is nationwide. facing. And so um, to see how everyone kind of approaches that, because I remember when I was in school, I, I, I mean, I had a cell phone and I was distracted. Yeah. You know, and it was I was at that age where there was not stuff in place to to you know tackle right. cell phones and so um i was just using my cell phone <laughs> yeah and you know i'd go as far as to say um even some of our adults are distracted by it too mm -hmm. so uh but you know back to let's say that a parent texts or calls a student who's in class that student still has to go to the teacher that you know teacher has to verify i mean you're really not saving a whole maybe lot make it time. last longer could possibly you know okay, I'm that's a good I'm point remind, i'm reminded of and you're only 26 so you won't remember this movie but i'm reminded of the movie ferris bueller's day off i uh, yeah. i love that movie <laughs> yeah where he gets his girlfriend out of school and they're double checking and, and so you know this has just added such a complexity to it for us but again what we're trying to do is you know there is research out there about the the um the mental health of some of our students that have such consistent access to a cell phone to social media to this constant feedback that's necessary and then you know you also take into consideration that especially our big big high schools there's areas of those buildings where there's not a signal so if you've sent a text and you don't get a response now there's that little heightened level of concern. Is everything okay? Mm -hmm. um, so there's just, and again, we don't have the answer. We're, I, it, all I can say is it's something that we are trying to come up with a protocol. Um, and I go back to whatever that protocol is, it will be a change. And with any change, you know, there is a little level of inconvenience associated with it. And our parents are going to have to be acceptive of it as well and try to work with the school district to to make it happen but from just our conversation here what what first comes to me and like i'm 26 i love cell phones i love technology yeah. you know I, go, I do a podcast like the 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 town of summerville's pio thing is all technology now you know but the same thing is our students need to be protected and mm -hmm. and to learn and so i think the, the, what from our conversation, it seems tenfold more reliable mm -hmm. to call the school district rather than text our children um, because of signal and you never know if they get the text. Right. I think it's just going to be a more reliable solution as right. well. It might be old fashioned, but it works, right? Absolutely. Um, another thing, and, and we'll talk, I want to dig in a little bit more about safety and, and our the safety of our children. But before we go in there, I want to stick on the technology side. Okay. Um, the big thing, AI. I'm sure yeah. you've been all uh, heard all about it, especially since you started. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I've seen, seen news articles and everything of students using AI to write their papers. Right, right. And to uh, help with tests. And it's, I mean... Our, our, our children are very smart. You know, they, 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 they got their workarounds, right? Yep. How do you approach the evolution of AI within the school district? Right. Um, so I, you know, most of the conferences I've um, gone to here recently, they have breakout sessions and I've tried to set in on the um, AI discussions. And what I will say is I have not found anyone that has this figured out <laughs> on any of the sessions I set in. What I would say, much like when technology started integrating into the classroom, I think we have to look at AI as not the enemy. Uh, because the more you make something the enemy, the more a student or an individual is going to try to leverage it. Yeah, yeah. And say, okay, so I can't use So let's not make it the enemy. And let's say, all right, it can be a powerful tool. How do we leverage it in a positive uh, manner? When it comes to writing papers, there is software that's been developed and slowly being developed. Um, that will help you um, determine and identify, much like you've probably used software called Turnitin and, oh, yeah, and Grammarly yeah. that will look for plagiarism. This will look for AI-generated um, text yep. based on your writing style. So, you know, I do some work with um, the professors at the Citadel, and they've actually started to use it, um, and they've brought people in and said, hey, listen, now, 
okay, that's one way to say, all right, you just generated, you know, a complete thought with AI and you didn't put any work into this. Or there's that opportunity where, and I'll be honest, I use chat GPT. Uh, most to people help, do nowadays. To help yeah. me get started on a speech. And then I that make writer's it, block. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. And then I make it work and fit the way I want it to fit and, and send the message I want it to send. So there are some positive aspects to this that we can leverage. It's just going to take some consistent research and work on how we make sure those pro- protocols fit the vision, philosophy, and ethical measures of a public school district. Yeah, and maybe it's, you know, I, I'm not, I don't have the answer, but maybe it's looking at, oh, okay, so they used AI, but it's only a certain percentage. Right, So right. that that helped, so they used it as a tool right. to help them enhance their, their thought. Right. And then you, you look at like, all right, once it goes beyond this certain percentage of the, you know, what's on your, your detectable tool, then you're like, okay, that's a little bit too much. I remember um, when I was in college, we had stuff like that uh, mm-hmm. because AI writing wasn't really there yet. Right. But there was um, there was it was it, there was other tools, um, not such like Chat Chat GPT, but other tools that uh, I remember when I submit a paper that I wrote, it it would come back with a certain percentage, mm-hmm. and it would be like, hey, this is this matches content from, you know, right. and you know, we'd had to stay under like 5%. Uh, right. I remember. And so, I mean, there's that, but well, AI, I mean, I even use AI, but the, uh, I talk, I speak with a ton of other PIOs. I have my PIO mm-hmm. group and within my role as a PIO, uh, one thing that we do and I, I really push to other PIOs is don't use it, copy and paste and just push it out. Because people will notice, yeah. and we've all, you know, we have writing is a skill and a, a something that we should all have some type of normal skill level on. And you don't want to give it all to right. AI to do, and you have to bring some more human, um, right. you know, mindset to it. Well, you know, and and one of the things that worries me a little bit about it is um, you're eliminating some of that. Um, critical thinking that needs Mm -hmm. to take place. And and so I just, I'll equate that to my health background. So if you want to get stronger, you got to work, you know, and you got to push through a threshold to get stronger. It just doesn't happen unless you artificially do it. And if you artificially do it, it's not sustainable. The same can be said with your mind. You know, you have to push through a struggle, which is critical thinking to get to a point you want to get at. If you artificially enhance it, you're not developing your ability to tackle challenges head on effectively absolutely and they you it's it's a tool um but it shouldn't be a a a you know lifeline it shouldn't be something that you use as like your number one like as another version of you right right right. it's just a tool in the tool belt absolutely um i've seen you know i I do a ton of reading of news i think it's just part of my role um one thing i've seen is there's even school districts or mostly colleges that i've seen that actually have ai courses now Mm -hmm. they're teaching on ai teaching how best use cases and stuff like that so i mean this is years this will be something we deal with for years to come yep and it's only going to get smarter it's only going to get better right um so I think it's very encouraging to the community that y'all have it on your mindset and yeah. you're, you're, you're already thinking about all of that as right. well. Staying on the topic of safety, but okay. moving away from technology, okay. but technology might be involved. Yeah. You know, our, I talked with uh, Lieutenant Montez Aiken about this, but the safety of our students in, in, in general, you know, from, from outside dangers that might foresee. And I mean, as the years progress, we see more just terrible stories that happen across the country and across the world. So how, you know, how does DD2 approach safety of our children while they're here on campus? Well, it's almost like AI, you know, um, you can put protocols in place, but 
you know, people who are going to commit crimes and criminal activity, they evolved. And so your safety protocols have to evolve with the environment. And so um, that's one of the things that we're trying to consistently do is to evolve our, our processes. Um, you know, we get 27,000 students. Yep. And so at 26 different locations, it is and a over 3 million square feet of rooftop space. So it's a small city um, that we're trying to maintain safety and security of, you know, 180 days a year. We really rely on outside partners, you know, our emergency medical uh, providers, our law enforcement providers to have good relationships with them. Because the one thing that they do is they're, they're looking for trends. What's trending across the state, across the country, and what do we need to be aware of, you know, at, in our school district in terms of um, potential threats? So yeah, trying to modify our procedures, but also going back to making sure we have unified protocols um, that are the expectations so that we can, again, you can have protocols in place, but if you don't train and practice them, then when you act, absolutely have to utilize them you're not going to be effective and efficient with them and so also doing that together with our partners so one of the things that we did and it was shared with me they think it's the first time we ever did it again with my military background i worked in um, the national disaster medical system so the whole incident command um, system protocols and so we had a multi-jurisdictional unified what's called an hc exercise so it's a homeland security evaluation exercise with our law enforcement our emergency managers our pios our dispatch centers our fire departments at um our one of our locations here in somerville just to practice those protocols um, together and find you know what's the weakness what's a gap where can we improve uh, and then we're going to try to do that on an annual basis now we do some of the smaller level um, skill sets and drills in our buildings every year some's required by statute some are that we choose to do on our own but again just consistently looking at okay what can we do Um, to improve and be better you know part of it is using technology so we have an anonymous reporting system some of the uh, incidents that we faced um, in the past two years have really been curtailed by anonymous reports you know and our community does a good job of reporting scenarios that they think we need to be aware of Um, the other thing is the use of you know better enhanced compute not computers excuse me um camera systems and making sure that we have better coverage and spread, making sure our law enforcement partners have access to our camera systems. So if there is an incident, they can see real time where that incident's occurring. So again, trying to make sure that we, we have all those small things in place that lead up to, you know, bigger, large scale operations. Yeah. And and that exercise we did last year, I was involved in that when in the PIO one in the, in the PIO group. And it was an incredible exercise. And I think for, from the PIO perspective, it was extremely helpful to work with the other PIOs and to work with all the different um, agencies involved to really get, you know, what I needed to do within my role. Um, and how we would work together, right? Yeah, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the things we learned coming out of that is uh, the PIO, all the PIOs, you now have a, a group uh, that meets consistently so that whenever we have a message going out, it's a unified message, you know, across all entities. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that was one of the things and uh, that we found was very advantageous for us. Yes, and it, it, it'll, it'll be extremely helpful because we'll be able to get the messaging out as quick as possible, mm-hmm. as accurate as possible. Um, and the other thing, and I, you know, we are definitely not going to go into the the actual strategies and everything like that for obvious reasons. Um, but I will say that from that experience and from all the conversations I had, our students are in very good hands when it comes to safety. And I applaud you. I applaud our law enforcement agencies and everyone, all the other agencies that are involved for staying in, in touch with where we're at right now and staying ahead and preparing ourselves for it well and i'd be remiss if i didn't say this it's about partnerships and relationships 
and all those entities that you mentioned, um, I feel like we're just one piece of that. And we have um, good relationships with those leaders to be able to do something like that. Um, and, and to safeguard, you know, what I consider to be the most prized asset in Dorchester County, and that's our students. 100%. You know, so um, I, I think the more we can continue to communicate and work together, refine and um, become more proficient with our protocols, the better we're going to be. Yeah. As a community. For sure. For sure. And I, I, you know, I'm excited to see how we continue to work together and have more of those exercises in place. I mean, one thing that, um, we did build that group, but the other thing is, is we built a, a PIO group across the tri-county area Mm -hmm. as well Mm -hmm. to bring us all together, get to know each other because that there was no such thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, me and, and a couple other people kind of took lead on that to really make sure that we all get to know each other, get each other's contact. Because if something happens in, in Mount Pleasant, then they are welcome to use us for help and then right. vice versa. If something, uh, God forbid, happens out here, then we have support systems from our tri-county area. And that's what makes our area stronger because... Right. We all no don't no matter if we are in different districts, different um, counties and cities and towns, we all are still affected by right. what happens in these different areas in our tri county area. Right. So being a team, that's what it's all about, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. That's what it's all about. So change gears. Okay. Um, you know, we were on a serious safety. Yeah. Um, one thing I want to touch base on is community engagement. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are some things that y'all do to really enhance and push community engagement in DD2? Well, you know, I mean, there's a whole lot of things that our PIO department does. Um, you know, we, we have a, we really rely on volunteers. And when you talk about community engagement, it makes me think of, we have a celebration coming up. It's our volunteer appreciation breakfast. Uh, and so that, that is a big part of what we do from my seat. Um, I've taken the approach that, uh, the only way that I can understand the community and make sure that the school district is a player is to have a seat at some of these tables. And so I sat on the chamber board, I sat on the economic development council board. uh, And so that really helps us know what's going on across our community and make sure there's a DD2 presence um, there. You know, one of the things that we did um, this past year, and if you reflect back to what I said early on, what one of my philosophies are, I believe that this role for me is about service. And so we have two days where all of our administrators, and that's over 100 plus administrators in the district, come together for professional development. Well, this past year, what we did is um, we chose one of those days to be a service day to the community. So all 100 plus um, administrators were in different locations, whether it was Habitat for Humanity, the Parks Department, or even at some of our school locations, mulching, cutting down bushes, painting buildings, and, and just trying to serve in the community. So you see us as more than just, you know, educators, but also uh, an important part of the community as a whole. I love that. And it's something about giving back to the community and really getting out there and speaking with, you know, the parents of our children and the um, local businesses Mm -hmm. and working with them and building that trust and relationship. And it all starts, and I'm a big advocate of face-to-face communication. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's important. Um, You know, we can all communicate on our digital media, but there's something about getting out and going to local businesses or uh, volunteering and getting to know people and getting to know your community. There's, right. there's something about it that's different. You know, I think when you do that, it's an opportunity, um, especially if you're in a leadership role, to demonstrate that I'm no better than you. Mm, uh, I, I put my point. pants on yep. the same way you do, one leg at a time, um, and you get to know a person and they're their, what really drives them, then you, your opinion may shift versus what you read or you know what you see from afar. I think when you get to know somebody one-on-one, you can, you can kind of see more about that person and what they represent. And so, uh, again, that's, again, I don't like titles. I, you know, I don't even, I don't like the title superintendent. I like the opportunity to serve as the superintendent, you know, and the things we can do. But I think community engagement allows people to see you a little differently. I love that. I love that. Now, 
this all, everything we talked about today, uh, and it all starts with the, uh, the staff, the teachers mm-hmm. and the staff that within our school districts. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would be remiss not to just thank our, our staff mm-hmm. who, who serve all our children on a day-to-day basis and the teachers that serve our children on a day-to-day basis. Um, one thing I want to discuss with you is, uh, you know, if anyone's out there listening who's interested in serving, you know, our the DD2 school district or certain students, how do they go about that? And uh, is there openings, you know, for, you know, for y'all as well? <laughs> well, nationwide there are openings. So, I figured, yeah. So, it's, yeah uh, it's, you go to um, our HR page. Um, we it has a listing of all the openings. But since you mentioned our staff, this is a good opportunity for me to say um, we do have an amazing staff. Um, I think that's what makes our school district special because there's this belief um, in our community as a whole. But I will also say that we're in the midst of some very challenging times in the field of education nationwide, and that is our pay scales have not stayed pace with the economy. And so um, we're doing everything we can to stretch a penny into a dollar to make sure that we recruit and retain the best staff possible. Um, But it is becoming more and more challenging because our our economic base is not the same as some of our neighbors. And so, um, you know, any of our educators and any, and when I say educators, I mean anybody that works for DD2, and that's almost 4,000 souls. Um, we are advocating to try to make sure we stay competitive so that we can retain them and we'll do anything we can to make sure that happens. Um, and so hopefully the community understands when that starts to become more of a discussion point, there's a reason why, uh, because we pay less than anybody around us. And you're 26 years old, so I feel comfortable saying this as I have a 26 year old, your generation as, and I don't mean it in a bad way, is not necessarily as loyal as generations four decades ago. It's true. And, and, it's true. and that's because, um, number one, in this area, the, the cost of living has changed. It's and so the crazy. salaries have to stay pace with yep. the cost of living so that we, we can retain you. If not, we're going to lose people to Berkeley County, Charleston County, Beaufort County, or up in the Columbia area as well. Um, and, and so that's got to be a focal point for us because we're who we are because of the people that work for us and the community that supports us. Uh, it, it's true. But how do you approach that, right? How do you, so there, there is that, that difficulty and it is nationwide. It's right. not just here right. and it's not just school. I mean, teachers and the school districts definitely are, are top of the list when it comes to the, the struggle. It's like that across the country, right. but other industries are struggling Absolutely. with that as well, for yeah. sure. How do you approach that? Because it's it's almost, I mean, it almost there's almost not an answer, right? right. Um, I think the answer is, and I used this real simple metaphor this morning with uh, a dear friend of mine who's on the county council, and I said, when you look at salaries, um, you look at they have to increase at the pace at which everything else is increasing, whether the it's economy. a gallon of gas, yeah. a loaf of bread, a gallon of milk, the cost of a house because the the quality of life diminishes further and further. So when you talk about how do you approach it, you're not gonna fix it all at once. So you just have to have a plan that you're incrementally trying to address it so you're not falling farther and farther and farther behind till you get to a point where you say, it's now critical, it's crisis mode, which we're almost there, and I can't financially do it without you know really hurting the community as a whole. So yeah. just having a plan, and I think it goes back to the relationships and the conversations that we have and, and demonstrating. And again, I, I've worked in multiple districts. I've worked in districts where they were declining, and so we bargained contracts. And the way that we were able to do certain things was to demonstrate that we are – we've got skin in the game to make it work. And so if we aren't willing to sacrifice to make it work, it's hard for me to go and ask for the community to support us, to help us make it work. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And uh, I think we'll, um, it's a challenge and I'm glad that I think you bring up a good point looking at the percentages of everything kind of increasing and kind of Mm -hmm. staying with that to make sure, you know, you're not falling behind, but at least, at least staying, staying pace, staying yeah. pace. Yeah. And that's a good start. Right. So I, I, um, 
I definitely will, will be wishing you all the best as you as you approach that. And it's the same thing with every um, all all around. And it, I just absolutely, I'm a big advocate of yeah. the teachers. I, I think teachers should. Um, you know, get paid well because they, they teach our, our children. And so it's, it's weird, you know, where it's at and across the country. Right. And I, I applaud you for having that as top of your list, um, because it's not like that everywhere. And so I applaud you for that. Well, again, I, I say our staff's what make us special. And if we don't invest in them, then we lose that. Great and point. I, and I just don't want to lose it. Yeah, no, absolutely not. So to bring this train home a little bit, yeah. um, I have a couple more questions. Uh, the first one is, you know, we talked a little bit about leadership and you are naturally in a leadership role now. It's kind of built over your career. We talked about that a little bit. What advice do you have for someone, maybe get some golden nuggets out there in the community. What advice do you have for someone who is looking to, for a similar role mm-hmm. or just looking to be a leader uh, in, the, in their life, in their career? Well, you know, uh, whenever I have a chance um, to talk to future leaders, um, the, I have simple advice. And the simple advice is, and sometimes I need to remind myself of that same advice, but number one is leadership is not easy. Um, because you're I always say when you go into a leadership role, you go in, pardon my military metaphor, but you go in with a full suit of armor and you have to make decisions. You cannot make a hundred percent of the people happy a hundred percent of the time. Mm. So when you make a decision that makes somebody unhappy, you're going to take a chink in that armor. You never get a new, new suit of armor, but you've got to be willing to take those punches you just have to ensure that the decisions, in my opinion, I, I use a, a, just a simple kind of litmus test for me. You have to make a decision and decisions that you truly think based on the information you have is going to have the greatest impact, positive mm-hmm. impact on the people you're making that decision for. And if you can look in a mirror and that person looking back says, this is for them and not for you then it's a decision that even though it's wrong that back to the failure piece that you adjust you know you adjust fire and you keep moving forward and you make it better but once you as a leader if you start to make decisions based on the recognition you think you're going to get and based on the personal accomplishments you're trying to achieve then that's not a leader i think that's a toxic leader Mm -hmm. so it goes way back to that whole selfless service and then the willingness to take shots and you know you know, most of us who serve, you know, we serve because we have big hearts. Yeah. I mean, just yeah. at the end of the day. And so we don't want people to think ill of us. Um, we want people to understand that what we're doing is just trying to make a positive difference. And, and I still struggle when people aren't happy with a decision I make, but it's something that you just have to accept when you're in a leadership role. Take, take the, take the punch. Right. Yeah, and, um, yeah. I, um, I've been fortunate to be in a leadership role at, at my age, uh, in a couple of different roles in my career so far. Um, and as a young leader, um, one thing that I noticed right away is, you know, the same thing. You can't, you can't be a people pleaser, right? You know, you can't, you're, you're not going to make everyone happy. That's the number one thing I've always heard. And I'm, and I remember when I was younger listening to the advice, because I'm a big advocate of listening to people who've been there and done that mm-hmm. because that's, what's going to make me better because people have already done it, been down that road. So why not learn from them? Um, and I'm like, Hmm, you know, that can't be the case. I mean, you can, there's gotta be a way you can make everyone happy. Right? No, no, no absolutely <laughs> not. And, uh, you, you just you like you said, and I think it's such a good nugget for people to take away is doing your best for the overall goal of what you're doing and right. and doing making the the best decision possible right and then just working and taking those punches as they go and over time time heals everything right yeah and so um, most of the time the, that stuff will move on but as a leader, and I, I know definitely you probably can speak way more into this than I can, but um, as a leader, it will continue to, there will be more opportunities for something that you know you will need to be addressed and you'll have to take another punch right. and another punch and another punch. But what makes a strong leader, uh, leader like you said, is someone who has that ar- armor and is able to take those punches, right. you know? And so, well, you know, the other thing too, I'd add into that is to, depending on the size of your organization. And that is you're going to have a team 
you know? And so, Mm. you know, for me, um, especially when I start somewhere new, I have to remind people that I, I'm not looking for you to just agree with me because I know that I don't have all the answers. So you need to empower your people to disagree with you. Mm -hmm. Now, at the end of the day, I I've told people, you know, we may disagree. I may, I may agree with, um, your recommendation. If I don't, at the end of the day, I'm the one that has to present it and defend it. So, um, but again, to have that constructive dialogue with your team and them feeling comfortable enough to speak freely, you know, and to criticize and, and likewise. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's, it's a great point and I appreciate you sharing that. I think the community is really going to take, a, I've taken something away today from that. So I appreciate that. I'm still trying to get some of my team to do that. <laughs> you know, we, we have cabinet meetings every Monday morning and you know, you can see the looks in their faces cause I've gotten to know them and I'm like, what is it? You're just tell me. And yeah, so they've got, they've it's got that anxiety. Better. It's yeah. that fear. Yeah. And you know, it takes, it takes a leader to be like, listen, trust me i you know put put your trust in me yeah. i want you to be yourself i want you to tell me your actual thoughts yeah. because that's only going to excel us forward yeah. you know because and it takes a good leader to admit that they don't know everything either and well so there's a table and i know on camera you can't see it uh, in my office now i have conference room next door but um when i have discussions with small groups we sit at that table because you know how you're sitting right now, it, it's more formal, mm-hmm. um, and it kind of reminds me of being the principal calling somebody to my office. You know, you're sitting over there, and I'm sitting <laughs> here. You're in trouble. So we sit there to try to break down people's guards so that they're more comfortable. Because I'm sitting at the table just like you're sitting at the table, mm-hmm. and we just have a discussion. And that's thoughtful thinking. That's yeah. thoughtful, forward thinking, strategic thinking about how to make your team comfortable. That's why that table's there. <laughs> I, I love that. I love that. Uh, last question, yeah. and then uh, we'll and the podcast you you moved here two years ago Mm -hmm. but i'm sure you've tested out some of the great food that we have here in somerville um can you name your top three favorite places to go here in in somerville okay um no there's more than three i know that because you're you paint me in a corner here you're gonna get me in trouble but i will tell you um the first place i ate at when i came down to interview i love oysters i went to bexley's <laughs> okay and I, I love bexley's but um a staple place that i really uh, go to is oscars. oscars if i'm going for a nice dinner oscars really good, we, yeah. we, we love oscars and and then i go to the the ice house a lot so oh, yeah yeah those are probably my three locations but um of course, I, I eat them all. Yeah, so. that's the thing. We, we were, I, <laughs> You're making it, me pick three, though. It's, it's so. the, thing, the thing is, is I, I, and most of I would say most, if I forget, the community tells me like, hey, don't yeah. forget to ask. Yeah. But yeah. Um, you know, the one thing is that's it's the hardest question that I ask in every episode that I do is that question because there that only tells us how incredible our community is yeah. and how great our businesses are, and especially our food and bed businesses because. You don't have to travel to Charleston. You don't have to travel to oh, uh, no, Mount yeah. Pleasant. You, we have it right here. Yeah. We have it right here. So, okay, so you, you don't get to nail me down to three because I eat out a lot, right? I'm an empty <laughs> nester now. But I've taken, I, I am the same I've way. taken my parents to um, Sweetwater, uh, yeah. one, two, three. That's an awesome yeah. place. Yeah. I really love the fact that they redid the kick and chicken because I love chicken wings, <laughs> especially during football season. Yes. So, and then Eva's is a, another awesome place. So they're... There's a ton. There's you a get, ton. We could sit here and do yes. a whole podcast yes. just talking about our food. I, I, I'm a um, I'm a quasi foodie, so I love to eat out. <laughs> you, you'll have to make your own little yeah. uh, Instagram page yeah. and have a little like <laughs> our food our food with superintendent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, but no. Um, thank you so much for yes, my taking pleasure. the time to thank meet you. today. I appreciate the conversations that we had, and I definitely foresee us having another conversation in the future for a second episode because I wasn't even able to touch base on everything that I had noted here because our, our conversations were this, just that great. So thank Good. you so much thank and you. to the community. Um, I hope you really enjoyed this episode and I'm really excited for y'all to listen to this and, and get the, uh, get a takeaway of our school districts here in the area. Um, and then everything we talked about, whether, whether it's, uh, you know, 
jobs uh, openings or your HR page or some anything else we talked about I'll have it linked in the bio and we'll kind of get uh, work yeah. together to get those links set up for the community so that way you could quickly access everything we discussed today but other than that until next time thank you so much thank you I appreciate it